uh, generally, especially for those of you uh, real interested in mechanical engineering or civil engineering, uh, this will lead directly into a course called Structures. This course actually goes by several names. In fact, uh, enough names that I'm not even sure uh, necessarily what we call it in the uh, in the uh, catalog. But it goes by several names, one of which is mechanics uh, of materials. We're going to look at the physical properties of a material and its response to load. So it's also called strength of materials. It's also called uh, things like uh, uh, deformation of elastic solids. Um, if you think about it, that's exactly what we want structural materials to do. We want them to be able to flex under loads, and when those loads are released, they return back to their original condition, ready to take the next load that comes in. Uh, nothing more than what you do when you come into class, and the building, whether you know it or not, actually flexes under the load of us being in here when we weren't in here half an hour ago. And when we leave the bowl, the building will return to its original uh, unloaded state. Actually, it's it's uh, it's sort of preloaded because the structural members of this building all are holding everything above them, which includes floor, walls, and ceiling, uh, as well as a lot of uh, general mechanical stuff uh, things up there. So this course goes by a lot of names. But it does come directly off of the statics we did last fall. So uh, everything we did there is going to lead directly into what we're going to need to do here. One of the very first things we're going to have to determine is what the external loads are. And then uh, from those external loads, we're going to do exactly what we did partway through statics, where we determine the internal loads in the material. <coughs> That's the uh, static response of the material itself, such that there is internal shear, uh, internal moments. We're going to also add some other types of loads. Uh, to this, and it's it's those loads, the, the material responding to the external loads, that is reflected in the deflection or the deformation of the structural materials that we're going to look at in this class. So that's the the basic idea of what we've got going there. Um, these two, the statics and the strength of materials, are so closely related to each other. A lot of schools put these together as a single four-hour class where we have them separate as two, three-hour classes. But they're that closely linked. So uh, our number one tools then, of course, will be that the forces on all our objects will sum to zero. And of course, the moments will sum to zero. And that's all forces taken into account in any way, whether they're internal or external to the structural piece itself. It's still going to have to be a static uh, situation for everything that we do. So let's uh, let's warm up with a, a real quick uh, little statics problem, and then we'll make the next step uh, as we look into the response of the material and start to start to get a touch on how things actually deform under these loads. To start with, we won't look at that def the actual deformation. We're, we're uh, a couple days away from that, but uh, we will very quickly get to that. So imagine a, a very simply structured object of some kind. where we have two uh, simply pinned um, straight members holding some kind of load there. Nothing more than we did in the static. In fact, we were doing this kind of thing pretty much in the first week of statics. We, uh, we went a little bit farther with it 
uh, as we went along, but pretty much we weren't doing a whole bunch more than uh, things like this in the very first weeks of static. So it's just a little bit of warm up, but it also allows us um, to make the next step uh, as we look at very different, uh, we take a very different viewpoint of this structure than we did in, uh, in uh, statics last term. So let's say we've got a 30 kilonewton load there. And uh, first thing we need to know is what are the external forces on each of these members. That's going to then allow us to look at the members themselves and see how they're going to respond to those loads. What we did in statics was we used those external loads to figure out what the internal loading was, the response of the material to those external loads. Now we're going to look at the, uh, the actual physical response of these members as they, as they uh, react to these loads. So uh, it shouldn't take us too long. We realize, I hope, or recognize, we, I hope that this is a three, four, five triangle, and <coughs> that means that all of the ratios of uh, all of the uh, forces in this are also of that same ratio. So we can figure out then, based on a force balance at point B here because that will then give us the forces in the two members since both the members meet right there that we can very quickly determine what the uh, external forces are and then we can make our next step then into uh, uh, this, the, the new subject matter we've got at hand. So that's 30 kilonewtons there. Obviously, then let's see, let's label these something. We'll call that FAB and FBC. They also must have the same ratios as that 3, 4, 5 triangle because. Uh, well, why? Let me ask you why. Why must the forces be in the same ratio? of 3, 4, 5 that the geometry itself is. It has to do with the fact that they're in the same directions. Well, why are they in the same directions? Two force members? There are two force members. All, both of these, the two structural members, AB and BC, are both two force members. Therefore, we know immediately that the forces lie in the same direction as the uh, members themselves. Well, at, at, more specifically, uh, in the line connecting the uh, two pins at either end. It uh, doesn't matter what the member does in between, the forces are directed through those two pins. So then we can figure out then uh, what the forces are without having to do too much quick calculation because we've got the same ratio in the forces that we have in the geometry itself. That's nothing more than anything we would have done in statics the first or the second week <coughs> we when we were doing that kind of stuff. What we're going to do now is take a look at the internal uh, forces that are caused by those loads. So if we bring this little piece over here. kind of blow it up there so that we can see it. We have this, in that case, the 50 kilonewton load is acting throughout this entire piece. And in fact, it's spread over that entire cross-sectional area. We'll only draw it, for the most part, as a single point load. But that's just 
for a matter of uh, expediency on our part. But there is a, a bit of a distribution of that force uh, over that area. That should make some sense to you because in general a thicker piece of material can hold a greater load than can a much smaller piece of material. Area most certainly does have something to do with it. That's not great news to you. You've got that kind of experience anyway. If you're building a deck, a dock, a woodshed or something, you don't want to do it with toothpicks. It's not going to hold. Well, you may want to do it with toothpicks, but you're not going to. There's just not enough material there to support the kind of load you're seeing. And this has to do with this cross-sectional area A. A very quick word about that force distribution over that area. It's not uniform. If we look at it at different places through the uh, piece, <coughs> it tends to have sort of a distribution that's like that, where most of the force is directed through the center of the piece, uh, tends to drop towards the edges. We're going to treat it even more simply, for the most part, as uniformly distributed, but not even that, we're going to treat it as, we, we're just going to say we have this force acting on that cross-sectional area, and we're not going to worry very much about the precise distribution of the force itself. Um, in more advanced studies of this material, yeah, you're going to have to. But for what we're doing here, and our start on this, we don't need to worry about too much more than just that there's some force in some area uh, as we're uh, concerned with it. So those two quantities, the force in the internal force in a material, in a, in a structural member, and its <coughs> cross-sectional area are right now the two most important things that we have to uh, concern ourselves with. Now as we look at the material and its response to this, and we're finally now bringing into account more than just the uh, length of the member, which uh, we looked at a lot in statics last term, um, we're now looking at more of what the cross-sectional area is. It should follow fairly, uh, with, with good fair sense, that the ratio of F over A would have some import to it. Makes sense, I think, as the force goes up, <coughs> things get worse for the material. As the area goes down, things get worse for the material. So the ratio of the two um, makes some good sense because it's their movement in opposite directions. As one goes up, and the other goes down, both of those contribute to a, a worst case, a, 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 a less advantageous situation for the material itself. And what we're worried about happening in this class is things going to the point where the structure itself fails. Whether the material actually breaks catastrophically or maybe it just deflects enough that the structure no longer works like it should, uh, it's quite possible that the load could go so low, even though none of the members break, that uh, the structure doesn't do what it's supposed to do in the way it's supposed to do it. So this ratio is very important to us through this class, and we call it the stress, and give it the symbol sigma. 
great lowercase sigma. As the force in a member divided by the cross-sectional area that is supporting that force. More specifically, this is known as the normal stress. Remember the meaning of the word normal to us? Perpendicular. Perpendicular. Because this is the situation where the force we're concerned with is perpendicular to the area we're concerned with. And that's indeed the case that we have here where the force is perpendicular to the area. Uh, what that should mean to you is that we can take other areas. They don't have to be normal to the uh, axial direction of the member itself. We'll, we're going to look at areas that are taken more on an angle and see what the forces are there. We're going to find out that's very, very important because when some of these things fail, they fail not at a direction perpendicular to their own axis, but at an angle off that axis. And you've seen some of this kind of thing before. When pieces fail, they don't fail in a nice cut across the piece. They fail at some angle across the piece itself. So you've seen this kind of thing before. The units. Take a rest. David, you're working too hard here already. Chris isn't ready to work at all. The units. Sort of. Two things. One is, you remember our long tradition in the physical sciences of naming uh, recurring sets of units of dead white male German physicists. So this is known as a Pascal. One Newton spread over an area of one meter squared is known as a Pascal. It's a unit of pressure. It's the very same unit of pressure that you use. And most of you have taken uh, physics too. So you did some fluid statics, you looked at pressure, this is the very same unit of pressure that was used there. Uh, it's exactly what it is. This is internal pressure, if you will, in a loaded member. Uh, we typically are going to be working with very, very large forces. So it's much more likely that we'll look at kilopascals and megapascals, even gigapascals, rather than just pascals themselves. But that's just a, uh, a matter of us taking care of the units as we work through these. Um, since we are American academics, we also need to look at American units. Typically, we look at them in uh, pounds per square inch. Again, since we're talking about rather large forces, for the most part in some of these structures, we'll be looking at more likely kilopascals rather, or sorry, uh, kilopounds or kip per square inch, or also known as a KSI, which is a kip per square inch. A kip is a thousand pounds, a kilopound. So uh, we're going to have to get rid, uh, uh, used to some, some slightly different units um, because these numbers typically can get rather large. All right, so we're looking here at the stress in a material, the force it's maintaining divided by the area of the material that's maintaining that force, that's, that's resisting that force, if you will. We'll uh, 
typically, or the, 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 the main <coughs> loading we'll look at now uh, for the first couple steps through this is either a tensile force or a compressive force. For, the, for several materials, their response to tensile loads is very much the same as their response to compressive loads. Steel, structural steel is very much that kind of uh, material where its ability to withstand stresses is about the same whether it's in tension or compression. That's not true with very other, uh, several other common structural materials. For example, wood. Wood is very good in compression. It's terrible in tension. It's a factor of somewhere around 8 to 13 difference. If you're building something, you typically <coughs> don't want to hang it with wood structural members. If you're going to hang it from something, if you're going to build a, uh, a shelving system that hangs from the ceiling of your garage, you're going to want to have it hang from chains or cables rather than from wood straps themselves. Concrete is also that way. Very, very good in compression, not very good in tension. Sorry, other way around. Uh, no, that's right. Very good in compression, not very good in tension. We're going to have to deal with that later in the term when we look at concrete structural members because they're very commonly used in, in uh, buildings, especially uh, a lot of modern scar skyscrapers. It's a very easy material to work with. It can be transported uh, in its uh, mixed form and then poured into the shape needed for the structures right on site. That's very, very useful to, a, uh, to an architect or a, a structural engineer in putting things together. It adds an ability to, to uh, add an, an aesthetic component to your structure to make it look good as well as have it behave well under these structural loads. So we've got all those kind of things that we're going to be looking at um, as we go through the term. Another type of simple loading, and we've looked at it some uh, in the, the uh, statics we had before, is that a structural member can have not loads that are actually directed, but are transverse to the material. Now for uh, for sim the simplest statics we can do on this, <coughs> those two forces are uh, have to be equal for the sum of the forces to be zero. Uh, remember it's also true that the moments must be zero. What we're talking about though when we talk about shear forces are uh, is the situation where the distance between these two is very, very small. So that we're not worried about the moment that that couple is causing, we're only concerned with the shear that it's causing. Because if we take a look at a piece, an imaginary cut through the piece, we know that that uh, causes internal shear forces and that can cause a different type of damage and it calls for a different uh, response from the material itself but it's still the ratio of the two the force over the area in which it's on which it's acting that is our concern in this case, these are, the force is not normal to the area, but it's parallel to the area. This is known as shear stress. And since we're looking, we're, we're assuming a uniform distribution of the force across that area, 
uh, we're specifically talking about average shear stress. All right, this is the type of thing that we'll see in, uh, in the pins that we're using to hold these pieces together. We've never looked specifically at the pinned joints themselves. We just assumed that whatever pin was in there was strong enough to hold it. But if we look at uh, two members that we've pinned together, we're going to do it by... Well, probably putting a rivet or a bolt or something through through the piece to hold those two structural members together. That pin itself then is under these type of forces that we have here, these shear forces here, where the area of concern is right there where the, the maximum amount of the shear is occurring. So we're concerned with the cross-sectional area of the piece and then we're concerned with the forces that that area is supporting. Uh, I have to draw something up here. So if I draw attention, it doesn't mean that compression is not a concern. As far as the pin itself is, is concerned, there's no difference between a piece being in compression and a piece being in tension attached to it. The pin itself still needs to, have, to resist that internal shear, uh, no matter what the piece is, uh, uh, what loads it's undergoing. All right, so we're going to go to the the uh, screen here. If it comes up, good. All right, I'll give you each a copy of this. We're going to now look at that very same structural uh, that object we had before. That simple triangular piece maintaining a load of thirty kilonewtons. But now we're going to look at the pieces themselves and figure out what some of the stresses are in those pieces. Because the places where the stress is the greatest, assuming that a piece is made out of the same material throughout, wherever the stress happens to be the greatest is going to be our place of greatest concern. So there's a lot of little structural pieces here, and we now need to look at all of them. So we'll pick one to start with. <coughs> let's look, uh, let's see, at the member BC, the, the diagonal member across the top of the piece. <coughs> now, uh, in the center of the piece, We have this cross-sectional area, a little exposed part there, for example. We have that cross-sectional area that needs to withstand the forces on there. And if I remember, that was 50 kilonewtons, was it not? And that cross-sectional area itself is, well, the piece has a diameter, you notice of about 20 millimeters. So it has a cross-sectional area of, how do you figure out the area? We're assuming that's a circular piece. You can tell that from the type of uh, shape that the, the person, the draftsman put in. Uh, that indicates a circular piece. Same kind of thing I did here on the ends of my piece. That's a common engineering notation to indicate it as a circle, uh, circular cross-section. How do we figure out the area of a circle with a diameter of 20 millimeters? Pi times 10 squared. Pi times what? Pi r squared. 
pi r squared or pi d squared over 4. And I've got that for you. Three fourteen times ten to the minus sixth meters squared. So we can figure out the stress in the piece at that cross section by simply determining the ratio of the force to the area that's withstanding that. So it's fifty kilonewtons over three fourteen times ten to the minus sixth meters squared. <coughs> what units? It's easy enough to divide those numbers. I'll give it to you. It's 159. And this is in tension, so we'll tend to call that a plus. You figure out what units. times 10 to the third newtons, that's a kilonewton, over, uh, we'll call it about 3 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. So the 50 over the 314 doesn't quite give us that. 50 over, what, uh, 0.3, right? So that would change this to 10 to the minus, the 50 over the 0.3 will give us the 159, is that right? So this will be now 3.14 times 10 to the... Minus 3? 10 to the minus 3. So we have 10 to the third over 10 to the minus 3. That's 10 to the third over 10 to the minus 3. They cancel? Of course not. They're not the same have to be the same to cancel. So it's 10 to the 6th. That puts it just in the newtons per meter squared or 10 megapascals. In, uh, in engineering, it has long been the tradition to keep the exponents on the scientific notation in multiples of three. Anybody know why that's long been the tradition? Because it's certainly not necessary. We have, uh, we have these, uh, these prefixes for just about any number. No reason we have to stick to multiples of three. Anybody know why? The tradition has long been stick to multiples of three if possible. You can't possibly know. So that's why you're looking at me so puzzled. When, uh, when I was a baby engineer, everything we did was done on a slide rule. A slide rule can do division of two numbers very easily, but it cannot take into account the uh, the, where the decimal place, uh, decimal point itself goes. That had to be done, we had to do that ourselves by doing this very type of thing, writing it down. We could do the division on a slide rule, but then we had to look at the, uh, 
sci the scientific notation itself and figure out what the result was then. And it's just a lot easier to do that in multiples of three uh, rather than get sevens and fours and all kinds of different things thrown in there. It was just easier to keep everything as a multiple of three to make life a little bit easier on the slide rule. Not a concern anymore. So it's not nearly often as done that we keep these in multiples of three because you just enter the whole number on your <coughs> uh, calculator and do the division straight away and take whatever's written down. Um, but I can't guarantee you're not going to end up working at some place where the uh, tradition is maintained very, very closely. It could well be. It's also uh, does simplify things and it keeps the number of prefixes that we need to remember down. Kilo, mega, and giga uh, are our main ones. We'll use micro a little bit in a step coming up here soon. Just a little bit of history for you. Uh, I guess I should ask, does everybody know what a slide rule is? Enjoy you know it. Okay, in my office I had one of those six foot yellow ones. That's the one I used to carry around as a freshman. No. Is that what you used to use instead of calculators? <laughs> those, yes, those, those were our calculators. In fact, um, one very nice thing about a slide rule is they automatically um, maintain the right number of significant figures in an answer because you simply cannot read a slide rule to any greater accuracy than uh, two or three places and that's automatically maintained through the piece. In fact, one way they used to get greater accuracy, more significant figures on a slide rule, is they simply built them bigger. I have my grandfather's slide rule. It's this long, and it's got a magnifying glass over the slider hairline so he can read it even more closely. It can be more finely divided. Uh, I imagine it was a very expensive piece. It comes in a leather embossed uh, case with his name in gold letters on it. Uh, what? Texas Instrument 01. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 0.01. Uh, it, was, it was a big deal. And if you go on eBay, uh, there's people that are trading in, in uh, uh, slide rules as now uh, almost like archaeological pieces. Um, no, nobody, I, very, very few people actually still use them. All right, so there's other places then we need to now concern ourselves. For example, up here at the end C, if you look at the drawing there and see what we've got, we've got the piece of end C actually flattened out a little bit so that it will then mate with the other piece there, and there's a hole put through it. Right, I'm looking at the, uh, the upper end of the piece of BC, the diagonal piece that goes across here. It's actually the same thing as the end down at B. That's a concern for us because now the cross-sectional area that's maintaining the force, internal force, has changed. If we look right across there, that area still needs to withstand the 50 kilonewton load. If we look at it in cross section, it looks something like this. There's the hole, and now there's the cross sectional area that's trying to maintain to withstand that 50 kilonewton load. Because the 50 kilonewton load hasn't changed anywhere along the piece. But now the area has changed that's withstanding that load. And so that piece is now, let's see, I think this is 40 millimeters across there. Is that right? And the diameter of the pin Because that's also the diameter of the hole through that piece. Make sure you know how to read these. It's that pin through there at D 
Steve, that's making this hole that's a 25 millimeter in diameter hole. Which means the area maintaining that 50 kilonewtons load has changed. So let's see how it changes the stress in the material at that point. The force is still the 50 kilonewtons. Yeah, there's a little bit of friction between the uh, wall attachment and that PC, but uh, we're not concerning ourselves. Remember, we're looking at these, unless uh, otherwise said, that are freely pinned pieces. So the friction there is, is very, very small. <coughs> so this is 40 by... What's that distance? 40 minus 25 is... Yeah, so that's 17 and a half, but there's two of them on either side, so we can concern ourselves with, with just the, the full area. 40 by 15 millimeters squared. And that's, uh, what, 60, 600 millimeters squared. Is that right? So what's the stress in that piece? That way we can compare it to the stress in this piece. Again, this is still a tensile load, so we'll call it a plus. So the stress in that piece now, who's got the calculator out? Anybody? David, you do. Did I do it right? What? The stress in the cross section? Yeah. This is this is the cross section. Is the, the 40 by 15 is right, isn't it? Is that the attached yeah. area? Because okay. remember, the whole area has been removed. So it's not there to withstand, and it's still at 50 kilonewtons. Uh, the 50 kilonewton force is now only through those two areas. The, the, the pin is not withstanding any of this tensile force. It's just holding the two pieces together. We'll look at the we'll have to look at the pin separately because the pin is in shear, but the member itself is in normal stress. David, what's that come out to be? Um, I got 83 and or 83.33. Something's wrong with that. Okay. So that's not the number I had. What did I do? Something's wrong there. I put it. I put it 50 kilometers. Oh. Oh, it's uh, in millimeters. No, no, this this isn't right at all. Because the area, uh, we also have to take into account the thickness of it, which is 20 millimeters. Then it's times the 40 minus the 15 millimeters squared. I didn't take into account uh, that thickness, which is 20. Okay, so 40 minus 15 is what, 25 times 20 is 500. That's still not right. So the 40 minus 20? 300, I meant. No, okay, that's right, now we're okay. Minus 25. 15 is the result. It's my first day, too. Is that better? Is that now the cross hatched area that's maintained? <coughs> that's resistant?
resisting that force. Okay, that's a little bit better. So it should be about 167 megapascals. Is that about right now that we got the numbers worked out? So notice that in the piece, in the center of the piece, we had just under 160. Now we've got somewhat over 160. As a designer, your concern is more now with the end piece withstanding that load uh, because it's under greater stress than is the center of the piece itself. Not by a lot. Typically when you design structural materials, you throw in a factor of safety of at least two anyway. But it does highlight the fact that the concern is not in the middle of the piece, but at the, uh, the end where the shape of the piece has been changed and is now uh, pinned through. All right, uh, any, let's see, any questions? What else can we look at? Let's look at the piece uh, A, B now. A, B, you'll notice, is a rectangular piece. So it's interior cross-section somewhere in the center is something like that. Imagine where this cut is. It's in compression, remember. If I remember by 40 kilonewtons. So what now is the compressive stress in this piece through the center of the piece AB? got to maintain the 40 kilonewtons, but over what area? It's this cross-sectional area here, so it's the thickness divided by the depth. Looks like it's 50. And then, and this is millimeters, how, how deep is the piece? Does everybody agree with that, 30? You actually have to look down at, uh, at this piece here. Here's A, B here, and you can see then its thickness is 30 millimeters there. So the area is... 600 square millimeters. I don't know where that came from. 1500. Looks a little better. So the compressive stress in that one, we'll give it a minus sign to indicate compression if we need to. Uh, since we're not talking about what specifically this material is, um, we're not directly concerned with whether it's compression or tension, but we certainly will be when we specify what the material is. We have to look at their response, the material response in compression and in tension. So what do we get for a stress there? Twenty-six point seven. One thing we're going to look at later in the term is there's a different type of failure in a piece like that that's under compression where it can deflect sideways, uh, just like a column would when it's loaded. And we're going to we're going to have to look at 
uh, how it resists the tendency of it to bow out laterally and in what direction it will do that. Then we have that. Um, so we can look then at, uh, at this other end here where it's now, uh, this part AB now comes into a U connection and it's now the cross-sectional area This is now at point B. It's now this cross-sectional area that needs to withstand the same 40 kilonewtons that was in the rest of the piece as a whole. Uh, I think by inspection you can see that there's more area there, so that's going to be of less concern in terms of failure than would the, uh, the original piece. In the center of the piece. All right. Any questions so far? Pretty straightforward. It's it's uh, not too terribly different than what you might have put together yourselves anyway. This idea that we're concerned with the force being exerted divided by the area that's withstanding that force. Uh, it makes a lot more sense to do it that way than it does uh, the product of the two, um, as we see. These uh, next point of concern, maybe let's look at uh, let's look at the pin at point A. We've got a. U-shaped connection at the wall. That's this uh, U bracket that's mounted right on the wall. And then the structural member AB fits in there and it's all pinned together. Now that pin A that pin at A is now under shear stresses <coughs> such that there's a 40 kilonewton force there and 220 kilonewton loads there. Just by symmetry of it, I know that, that it's the 220 kilonewton loads over that pin A. If we look at this little piece here, if we look at that little piece there, it's got a 40 kilonewton load that way from the member AB itself. And we must have shear of 20 kilonewtons across that face there. This, by the way, is called double shear. For uh, hopefully obvious reasons, there's shear at two places. Uh, of equal size on the piece. Is this piece in equilibrium?
Yes or no? Phil, you're nodding. Randy, you're nodding. Yeah. David? Yeah, lift piece is an equilibrium because uh, whatever couple is caused by the 20 kilonewtons um, uh, is, is defeated by the 40 kilonewton itself. So the shear then, or the uh, shear stress then, is what? How much shear is being withstood by how much area? Do I put in 20 kilonewtons here or do I put in 40? What's your feeling? It depends. It depends on what area it is put in. If I put in the 20, then I put in just one of these areas withstanding that 20. If I put in the full 40, I've got two areas withstanding that, but either way the ratio comes out to be the same. But it's the force being resisted divided by the area resisting it. In this case, we have a 25 millimeter. Area. So, uh, just one of those areas is withstanding the 20 kilonewtons. If you put in the full 40, you double the area and you get the same ratio anyway. What's that come out to be? Got it, David? here or so. Oh, that was Oh. I don't want that. I want the shear stress. Oh, yeah, 20, 25 over 2 then squared. Forty point seven what? Is that a question mark? I'm not sure if they use pascals and shear. Either one. It's not strictly a pressure, but we still use the same units. We still use pascals. Um, Forty point seven without any scientific part to it, any scientific notation part to it, is megapascals? I think so. Depending on what material that is, you need to look at the ability of the material to withstand the shear stress. Certain materials, uh, it's very, very much a concern of how they react to shear stresses. For example, if you look at a piece of wood as a pin, which is very common, if any of you, especially in the Adirondacks, we have a lot of those timber peg homes where the, the uh, girders and the joists and uh, all the structural members are held with wood pins actually driven into the holes. If the grain of the wood runs this way, then the wood pin is very good in shear. If they cut those pins such that the wood grain ran this way, then it's terrible in shear and that wouldn't, wouldn't last very long. 
if you even go buy a simple uh, simple dowel at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, all of them are with the grain this way. You can't even find a piece. Nobody would do it. It just uh, wouldn't hold, wouldn't suffice. <coughs> All right, any questions? There's other places that uh, are could be of concern and we need to look. We need to look, at, if you were actually designing this, you'd need to look at every single one of the ends as well as the, the, the places themselves. For example, if we look at pin B, Pin B is a rather interesting piece itself because because it's got several loads coming in there and they all come in certain uh, in different directions. For example, the, uh, the 30 kilonewtons, which is straight down, <coughs> is actually over two areas that are uh, supported by this, uh, I don't know what you call it, this little bracket piece. So we actually have one, two, three, four, five areas on B that need to maintain some of the load. The two skinny outside areas where that bracket is, and then the two or three areas, I guess, that are about the same size that uh, need to maintain the, where the structural pieces come in. So if we try to draw these in some direction, let's see. on the two outside slender pieces. Now, I'm not showing even the outside part of the pin that's not in contact with any area because there's no load on that. There's no load on it. There's no uh, shear concern there on those, those parts of the faces. By symmetry, we assume half of the 30 kilonewton load is on each one of those. And then uh, the part B, uh, AV comes in, that's this U bracket at the end of that, so that's the two pieces, and that's in, uh, the piece itself is in compression. Uh, what was the load in that? 40 kilonewtons, right? So there's 20 kilonewtons on each of these. And then the diagonal piece itself comes down B. That's just the center piece now. And it's in pieces in tension, so it's pulling on the pin there. And so we have those loads. A little difficult to draw, as three dimensional things always are. But that's the type of thing that's happening at, at pin B if we turn it on its side. We'd see the two 15 kilonewton loads coming down like that. The two 20 kilonewton loads doing that. And then the 50 kilonewton load doing that. So the concern with this pin, pin, the pin in B, is which one of those faces, we have these four different faces where there's four different shears going on, which one of those faces is subject to the greatest <coughs> shear stress? Because you have to design for the greatest load in, other, in order to maintain all of the loads. 
the area is the same for them. Let's let's label these these faces with some just some reference letters. E, F, G, and H. What's the shear at face E? Actually, I got to draw that one in a little bit more on that piece there, because acting on that that section. So if I look at just the face E, the first face where we're seeing shear. It's the face between this U bracket, the, the uh, load bracket, and the uh, end of the piece um, AB. What loads are on, what shear load is on that face? And is that the face of concern? That's maintaining just one of the 15 kilonewton loads. The same thing is going on at face H, just in flipped around the mirror image of it, so we don't need to look at that. And that puts an internal shear of 15 kilonewtons at the face E. That again is the load bracket pulling down on the pin. And so the shear stress at face E is 15 kilonewtons. And what's the area of pin B that's withstanding that 15 kilonewtons? Pin B is how big? Here's pin B, 25 millimeters. And so what's the shear there? 30.5. 30.5. Looks good enough. Any units? Megapascals. All right, so your get out of class question. What's the shear at face F or G? They'd be the same either one. Shear stress at face F and G. easier to look at it on end because it's got the two loads like that. It's only half of the loads from the members because there's two sides maintaining this. Both F and G are resisting this, so we only put half of the loads there. What's the shear and the area is still the same, it's the same pin. It's uh, certainly possible I guess that we could have a pin that changes an area, but we don't in this case, just a simple cylindrical pin put in and then held with uh, Clovis pins.
Got it? You ready? Wow. First day, first get out of class question. Area is no trouble. Same pen, same area. But what's the shear there? Once we know what the shear is, we just put it in divide. It's real easy. What is the shear there? Is it 35? Remember, we don't add the magnitudes of vectors. We add the vectors themselves. So those two vectors added together have got to be resisted by a shear across the face, something like that. How big would it be? 25 kilograms. In fact, that's our 3, 4, 5 triangle again. And again, if you look at the two areas, F and G together, they're maintaining 50 kilonewtons in the double area, you get the same ratio anyway. And you get 50.9 megapascal.